Welcome to episode 244 of the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. This is the first podcast dedicated to helping engineers and technical professionals with both their personal and professional development. In this episode, I will be talking to Andrew Sario, an intelligent transport systems engineer and OT cyber specialist. He's the creator of Engineering IRL or Engineering in Real Life and engineering book author about problem solving skills for engineers. Andrew provides some great tips that will really help you to master these skills and become the best engineer you can possibly be. I'm your host, Jeff Perry. I'm the new host of the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. I am a leadership and career coach that helps engineers and technical professionals realize their true potential. I love helping people make intentional career transitions and optimize their success. Often, that means we get to work on developing soft skills like leadership and mindset to unlock their hidden potential and remove self-imposed roadblocks. I founded More Than Engineering to bring together my love for engineering and technology with my passion for helping people improve and live more fulfilled lives. And I currently run a program called the Engineering Career Accelerator. You can find more information at engineeringcareeraccelerator.com. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about our guest for today. Andrew Sario is a professional systems engineer and he's the founder of Engineering IRL that helps engineers build a successful life in engineering. As an author, he writes children's engineering books and he recently wrote the best-selling book, 10 Plus One Steps to Problem Solving, An Engineer's Guide. He's also the director of CloudMate Networks, an Australian cloud networks retailer, providing small businesses access to the cloud via the Cisco Meraki technology. Andrew is a husband and father. He's dedicated to his family and in particular is passionate about his children's education, happiness, and success. Now let me bring you into our main segment with a quote that is applicable to today's topic. This quote is from Albert Einstein. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Now let's jump into the show. Now it's time to jump right into the main segment of our episode. Today's topic is about problem solving skills for engineers. I'm with Andrew Sario. Andrew, welcome to the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. Hi, uh, hi Jeff, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Now, Andrew, before we get started and really dive into some of the questions and conversation, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about what it is that you do on a daily basis? Yeah, um, so I'm a uh, ITS engineer, which stands for Intelligent Transport Systems Engineer. And essentially, uh, what we take care of is all the systems on the on the roads and the tunnels. There's actually a lot of infrastructure and technology behind all of that so that we can have it um, open and running 24-7. And there's a lot of monitoring systems and control systems behind that. So a uh, key part of what I do is I make sure all of those systems are running. I could be doing some design work because we upgrade uh, those those things. We're looking at the, rec- the, the the newest technologies, for example, and we really make sure that we're uh, a have everything lined up with the standards, and we can keep things uh, running. And b we try to look at the you know we try to be innovative and look in the future and see what's the new trends and technologies and see are there efficiencies that we can gain and uh, and and things like that. So my day to day is mixed with a lot of uh, engineering type tasks, you know, from, from design to analysis. Uh, sometimes, you, you know, we have to do a presentation on, on a proposal for a solution that will make something better, like an efficiency that we've gained, for example. So it's a nice mix of that. And, uh, and uh, the, other, the other part of it, so that'd be more of the daytime. And then uh, at the nighttime, I'm, I'm working on a few side projects and things like that. Well, I mean, the daytime, you must be busy enough doing this ITS engineering, uh, but you have so many of these other side projects. Can you tell us a little bit about these projects and how do you manage balancing all of this with your, your work life? Yeah, uh, no, I, I, can, I can tell you about that. So what I'll do is I'll just answer the first part, which is you know some of the side projects that I am working on. Um, everything that I've been doing uh, more recently is centered around uh, engineering IRL, where essentially it's a website that I create content for, right? And the content uh, is audio, uh, video, I've got some, you know, videos that I've started and, and, and written. So I'm writing articles and I write books um, and, and 
and host the Engineering IRL podcast. Um, now, how I'm managing to balance all of these types of projects along with, uh, you know, my day-to-day -day job as an engineer is, uh, it's kind of what I, what I, I treat it as a cyclic approach. So the way I do it is between each, uh, for each project that I'm doing, I'll try to do like at least a basic end-to-end -end level for that project. So for example, if it's a book, the first thing I'll do is I will write all the chapters in terms of just the headings, just the titles. And that's the whole thing. So that's one cycle. Then I would write maybe a, a description of each chapter and get that all done in a circle. And then if I was doing like a software project, I'd maybe write all the modules with empty skeleton code. And then over time, what happens is, you know, sometimes you're working on one project and you want to be working on another project. I can switch between them. And because it's kind of cyclic, you've, you've got somewhere to pick up where you left off. You don't have as much time where you're stuck uh, between tasks. And so maybe over the course of the year, I, I work on four major projects and it seems like, oh, you did these four projects at once along with your job, but really it's, it's this cyclic thing where I'm working on one, then the other, then the other um, in succession, but always in parallel with, with my main job. So that's the simplest way that I can say that I try to manage all of that. Um, and the other part is trying to use found time. So, you know, I listen to podcasts. If I want to read, you know, that comes into like uh, right now, I've been working from home a fair amount. You know, that's now been mixed in as a normal day to day um, because of, you know, what's been happening. And that instead of that travel time now that that adds in some reading time or that means I can work on the, on, on other side projects more. So it's trying to balance that and find you know, these little times, lunch breaks and things like that, where you can do certain, certain types of jobs, so. Yeah, well, and I appreciate that approach to really put in these structures and kind of think of things on a cycle, take, take them chunks at a time so that you don't feel like you're overwhelmed by the immensity of the entire project, but you can break it up into small pieces. And I think that's exactly. a critical piece to moving through challenges and, and projects like that. So you mentioned writing books, and I think you just released a book called The 10 Plus One Steps to Problem Solving. Seems to be going well, but can you tell us a little bit more about this book, what it's about, and what you really hope to achieve when you wrote it and came up with it? Absolutely, Jeff. Um, so yeah, so I, I did release a book um, towards the end of last year called The 10 Plus One Steps to Problem Solving. And what it is really is it's an engineer's guide on uh, how to problem solve. And it was born from uh, practical experiences. And over time, what I found was uh, certain problems would come to me. And at the beginning, you know, you struggle through them and then over you, you get better and better at it. And you get to the types of problems where people have been stuck for days and then you get into it and then you can solve it. Right. And it's like, how did you do that? And I would be like, okay, so is there something interesting here? Like, am, is it something repeatable? A and B, is it something teachable? So uh, I started trying to figure out what those patterns were. Um, and then eventually that came to be 10 plus one because I would kind of walk through these same steps and it would help break down, down problems. And uh, a lot of the times when I was mentoring, you know, new engineers coming in, you know, we have all these official methods and ways of solving problems. And this is to say that you would still do all of those things. You still have them in, in your toolkit. This is just going, what else can I try? Or what should I try next? Um, or, you know, and it works in, uh, it works with the other uh, problem solving tools that you have. And because it's a guide, really, uh, you can jump between steps, you can go back and forward. Um, it's just a tool to help you think about uh, the problem that you're having in order to solve it. Yeah. Okay, um, and excellent. so, yeah, that's, that, that was, that, that was the goal. The goal was to really try and go, can I, can I, can I share this? Can I help other engineers out? Can I, uh, you know, put a piece out there and, you know, in the nonfiction world for engineers, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's nice to have a book that covers that side that's designed for engineers. Um, so I do a fair bit of reading and, and, and I'm always looking at that part of the market and I was like, all right, cool. I could, I can write this and make it into a book. So I, I include a lot of stories in there from my career. Every step I put in like a, um, maybe like an anecdote or something that I know that has happened. You know, when you, you know, you, you talk to people and they're like, oh, you know, I had this problem and it was like this, this is the story that happened. And then, you know, after doing all of this, we get to the end, like, that was the answer. Um, so I tried to capture a lot of those type of stories. 
and I mix in a lot of uh, diagrams and and then pictures and all that sort of stuff just to just to uh, uh, you know break up the reading. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a fabulous resource and something a lot of engineers could benefit from because problem solving is a part of everyday life as an engineer, and I think a lot of engineers get into engineering in the first place because they love to solve problems. It's one of the things that Absolutely. is really fun for them. They love seeing that there's a, a challenge and, and they want to they want to fix stuff. And so yes. we're always working out solutions to problems. But um, can you talk to us about how we talk about problem solving in engineering specifically? Because maybe some of the problems that engineers uh, deal with or, or face are different than some of the other uh, problems that people in other functions or industries might deal with. So what is engineering problem solving and why would you say it's really important to, to use that? No, uh, that's, that's a good question, uh, Jeff. So I think um, to, to, to break it down, so at, it, at its heart, at its crux, all of engineering problem solving, there's different ways and approaches and, and methods, as I mentioned, but at the heart of all of it, really it's going, how can we break this problem down into its individual parts? into solvable chunks that we can do, put that all back together in order to tackle big problems, yeah? No matter which one you look at, every, every method, you know, there's, you can do a swim lane diagram for something or a fishbone diagram, or you can do some sort of, you know, analysis or whatever it is, ultimately that's what you're doing. And it's important because the types of problems that engineers tackle, typically we, we do a lot of, uh, you know, smaller problems and stuff, but a lot of the bigger problems that we do tackle are bigger than what one person can solve, right? So to be able to do that, that means you can bring on a team, we have multiple engineers and we can solve a much bigger problem than the sum of its parts, right? So that's why it's important. The other part that makes it important is um, for, for our industry, and it's probably similar in other industries, but I think something that's a little bit unique is what engineers do with their problem solving is over time, we try to capture the best practices what's the safest way to do things so that we don't we can still solve those same problems without anyone getting hurt right when they first build the bridges you you have a death toll now you don't build a bridge or anything with any death toll there is no you know we don't worry about that type of stuff because we try to iterate and improve on all the uh on the, on the industries like best practices so that we can come in and do solutions that are safe so that's that's the two key reasons why it's important one is because we are able to tackle much bigger problems than an individual could. And two, we can do it safely. We can do it better than we did before. Well, that's awesome. And hopefully maybe you can help us contextualize this a little bit, Andrew. And you talked about some of the anecdotes and stories from your own career where you've used some of these tools. Can you give us a real life problem solving scenario or example that you've had to move through and resolve? And what has that experience taught you? Okay. Um, yeah, I can do that. Uh, it's kind of interesting. So something I like to do uh, in the book and, and in the engineering podcast is I try to take an engineering concept um, and figure out how, how I can apply it to real life. Yeah. So some of these engineering problems, okay, I could tell you like, you know, we use this technique and that's how we solve this, this problem. There was an intermittent fault and, and things like that. But I think uh, sometimes that those technical details are very niche to that field, right? It's like you're speaking a language only someone working in that industry would understand. But I think it's a fun exercise sometimes to try and apply one of those techniques that we think, oh, this is only for engineering problems and put it to real life. So um, it, it's a bit of an interesting one. It might, be, it might seem a bit roundabout, but it, it is an example I go through in the book. And I think it's a kind of a unique way to look at things. So for example, I have... Um, uh, and I know a lot of people, you know, they're trying to fix their posture. Yeah, you have problems with your posture. We're always on, you know, engineers nowadays are always around computers and hunched over, you a bit more working from home and things like that. So the posture becomes a challenge sometimes. And, you know, the, the rough solutions for them, you can quickly Google, you know, how do I fix my posture? And they'll tell you there's some techniques like, you know, uh, make get a colleague to pat you on the back between the shoulder blades every time you're slouching to remind you or, you know, you, there's a post-it note system. You put post-it notes in strategic places around where you work every day. And that is your, put a reminder on it that tells you, oh, stand straight. It's, just, it's a habit training thing, yeah? And I even uh, used a product before and I've recommended to people is, it's a, uh, it's, it's a device that sits on the, you know, kind of on your back. 
and it monitors it connects to an app on your phone and it tells you when you say oh vibrates time to stand up right anyway so um for some people that works and for some people it doesn't and the question is wait why doesn't it work like you know i've tried everything kind of thing and uh, a useful technique that i helped people arrive to the next answer is there's something called the hierarchy of engineering controls yeah i don't know if you're familiar with this but it's for usually it's for safety we use it for um uh, when we identify a hazard, engineers will go through the hierarchy of engineering controls to decide which solution is the best for the risk, right? For the out, you know, we want to make sure that this is done in the safest manner. And just to make sure the audience is all on the same page, the engineering technique has layers. And ultimately, to go to reduce a risk from happening at the very top, it's the least practical, but the most effective way is to eliminate it. Right, you've got to, you, you have to put some liquid on the floor and people can slip over it. A, we go, can we eliminate it? Can we just take it away? That way no one can get hurt, it's most effective. But sometimes it's not practical. Maybe we don't have the tools to remove that. So you move to the next down the list, it's substitution. Could that liquid be a different liquid? Something less slippery. Can we use something else here instead to reduce the risk, right? So it's like this other thing could do the job as well, but maybe it won't hurt as much if someone, someone falls. And then uh, the next two that I'll get to is there's engineering controls. So after that, okay, I can't protect this. I'll build a physical barrier, right? We can't get rid of it. We'll build a physical barrier. It's less practical, but hey, we can do that. Um, and then you move further down the tiers, which is a less effective one, but one you might be familiar with is a sign that says, hey, this is slippery, slippery when wet, don't come here, a warning sign. Now where this, and I'll tie it back into our original problem, where this uh, technique gets interesting is one thing that you learn is that um, multiple controls from the same uh, tier become less and less effective. You get diminishing returns. So for example, if you're if someone was going to slip over that puddle and there's a sign that says, you know, it's wet here, you might slip and they fall. If you had a second sign there, like right there with it, what are the odds that that increases the chances they, oops, I better not. Or a speeding sign, you have a speeding sign you know, it says the only thing stopping you from speeding at that point is a sign that says 60. So you stick to the 60. But if you were going to speed over that and there was a second sign, odds are you, it wouldn't make a difference, right? So you want to minimize the multiple controls in the same tier and then maybe think about, hey, if this thing keeps happening, maybe we need to move up a tier. Maybe this should be a barrier. Maybe we should, you know, do these other things. And so back to the, the posture problem, you know, the 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 tapping on the back, the little visual cues and the, the device that reminds you, all of them are administrative controls, right? They just tell you. And so maybe for someone that's struggling, even with all of these cues and things, then it's just not working. They need to move up a tier and go, is there a barrier? What's the physical thing that could actually prevent me from doing that? And maybe the answer is like a back brace or a, a back support thing that you wear and you go, okay, maybe that's the level that I need to be approaching it because none of these extra reminders are going to make a difference if they have it now. And so that's what, that's, you know, an example of where I take a, and it, it seems random, like why, why are you using that for this? But the whole point is to, and this is with a lot of the problem solving, is to think think through problems in a creative way. There's a, you know, if there's a known solution, go for it. And and I do cover this in the book as well. Like if, it's a, if there's a known solution, that's what you go for. But sometimes you need to uh, approach things and, and utilize other tools that gives you a different perspective. So you can look at something differently and then and, and tackle the problem that way. Yeah. Well, I love that tool. And I also love your philosophy of taking these engineering tools and processes and, and techniques that we use in, in the technical world, and we can apply that in other areas of our lives uh, to, to solve other types of problems when we're working with people or just trying to better ourselves, like you used the example of posture. And, and you gave me the administrative control. You, you kind of reminded me, I found myself kind of standing up a little bit straighter here. Uh, that was administrative control. You gave me the cue and, and I changed. And, and uh, so in that sense, at least for a few minutes here, that's going to help. But <laughs> later I'll, I'll probably hunch back again. But uh, what a great example of being able to take some of these engineering principles and apply those in new ways and, and move through that. Something that a lot of people can relate to. So you obviously have this 10 plus one framework um, I'm curious, 
if you can share with us some of these practical steps to really move through problem solves when engineers are, are trying to tackle something. Uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, it's funny that you asked this one because there's always the, there's the long answer, which is the book. <laughs> and then there's the short answer, which uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, when people ask me like, hey, hey what are some of these steps? Uh, the two approaches are go into detail for the first few and you go, okay, I get the idea. Or you say, let me uh, run through all the steps so you get an idea of what the overall process is. But I think um, for your audience here, it'd be best if I, if, I, if I run through all the steps at a high level and try to make it as short and succinct as possible to get the punchlines. And then you can kind of see how this picture comes together and, and see why it's more of a guide that helps you, you know, jump through these problems, help you think through problems and, and, and the coolest part of it is that you can jump between these steps. So the step one, that's always the first step of any problem that you want to solve is the question. Are you asking the right question in the first place? And a lot of the time people forget this step or they go deep into the problem solving. So my methodology is built so that when you, even when you go three, four steps in, you can return to step one and go, now am I asking the right question or should I be saying something else? And it's similar to how you uh, think about uh, Henry Ford back in the days, you know, there's always that famous story where if, you know, if he asked people what, what they wanted solved, they would say faster horses, but really what, what's the real question now? How do I get from A to B faster? And that's how he said, okay, I don't, it doesn't have to be a horse, right? So that's always step one. Step two is called the obvious. And this is what I mentioned before. You want to do all the known solutions. There's some things that just everyone knows you try this. And let's say you tried it, it failed, try it again. Like give it another go, you know, all these quick things that you know should work and maybe they don't. And but this many, many times that I've experienced where someone says, hey, I have this problem. You go, oh, show me, do it again. And they run it again and it works. It's like, what happened? Like sometimes it's, you know, it, you know, in science we say uh, for something to be statistically significant, you want to have that result happen like three times, for example. So if something fails, unless it's failed a few times, you can't really take that as statistically relevant. And so that is a step that you can try. And I also try to err people away from, um, and this is from, you know, research on different problem solving. You know, you look up the list, what are the 10 steps, five steps to problem solving? And there's all sorts of lists out there. A lot of them get you into doing all these analysis and breaking down options and all, all early solutions, looking at early. And for me, it's like, just try it again. Like we don't need to have a conversation, do an analysis. Just try that, that obvious thing that we know usually works. Let's try it and find out. Right. So that gets you into that problem solving very quickly, very practically. Um, and where I take you next is, okay, we've done the obvious things. Uh, the next step, and these uh, titles in the, in the book, these step titles are meant to make you think a little bit, but the step three is called eyes. So eyes is, do I have the right eyes on the situation? Do I have the right logs? Have I looked at all the, do I have all the right sensors in place? Do I have the right tools in place that can tell me clues about the problem? And make sure they're all in place because as you step through, you want to make sure you can, you can you'll see the problem when it does occur, okay? Right. Step four, then I get people to look at what's called the, the obvious, which is, oh, sorry, not the obvious, is uh, it's called check yourself. And it means check yourself before you wreck yourself, okay? And, <laughs> and these, like these things are, are the, we, we, we call it in um, network engineering, there's the OSI layer, and we call it layer one. So when you have network communications, like we're doing right now, we're, you know, goes over the internet, over the cloud, and then you've got all these packets and bytes, they form, you know, messages so that we can have, you know, video bytes and we can have our conversation. But underneath all of that, there's a cable, there's a physical medium, there's something underneath everything that we call layer one. And this is the step where you check layer one. This could be, you know, uh, maybe you have issues on your power supply. Oh, did I power cycle? Did I reboot? You know, these things where you spent ages solving a problem and then it's like, ah, oh, I didn't, and then you restart something and like, oh, and it works. And all these things you tried was big waste of time, right? So you want to get this in early, but not too early, yeah. Um, the next step is I call it Dr. G and it's Google it. Google it, you know, we're engineers. <laughs> you can Google it. You don't have to know everything already. You can Google it. And all the engineering problems that you are looking for, sometimes they're, they're hard to find the answers. We have proprietary software. We have, you know, uh, it's very niche or, you know, the, it's hard to find answers, but there are online forums you can consult. Maybe the manufacturer has an online form that it offers, or you have to go to your online resources. And this is the time to do that. You know? Step six uh, is a fun one. It's called the RTFM protocol. 
I don't know if in, in your travelings you've seen heard this phrase, but uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a slang, but normally you think it's some technical protocol that I haven't tried yet or tool or something, but it stands for read the F thing manual. <laughs> <laughs> read the manual. It means read the manual. And, you know, engineers are notorious for not reading the manual. I can figure this out. I don't need a manual. But you'd be surprised the type of information you can find in there. So that's the RTFM protocol. Make sure you do that. Uh, the next step I would say is it's called strip. And it doesn't mean physically with your clothes, it means strip down the complexities of the problem and try say, can I prove something basic first? You know what I mean? Can I remove one layer or one variable? And is this still true the way I think it would be true? So this is where you start doing a bunch of testing and changing things and seeing until you can prove that one equals one. You know, prove you know something about the problem that you expect. Um, and it helps you solve problems. And then step eight is, and, and you notice a trend here, you know, the longer you go and the more steps you have to deal with, it sounds like the problem's getting more complicated and you're needing more things to, to work on it. So uh, step eight is called, what about the environment? It's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a joke on like, you know, when, when people, well, so what about the environment? No one's talking about the environment, but it's, it's one where when you're dealing with a problem and you're this far in, you've, you know, you've, you're up to step eight, that means it's a big problem. It's time to think about things like the environment, which means what are things outside of your problem that could be related or impacting it? Mm. And that's where I mean the environment, like literally the weather. Like, right. is it every rainy day you have this issue, it increases the humidity and it impacts this equipment? Is it so hot that it has this impact? And the more common one is, you know, is it the time of day? And oh, at this time of day, this person runs a shift. You know, we had a problem with uh, uh, someone that there was a, uh, one of our components failed you know, at 5 p.m. every day and no one could figure it out, but it turned out that one of the, the cleaners would come in and use a certain power socket with a high powered vacuum and it would actually trip a protection circuit at that timing. And it was just not related to any of the technical problems that were happening downstream. So what about the environment? Uh, step nine, phone a friend, ask a colleague, ask someone, someone that might know. And the interesting part is why did I place that at step nine and not at step one? But the purpose is to try and how do you solve problems, right? If you can ask someone at step one, Maybe it's a critical thing. You have to understand the problem. Like it's a critical thing. We need to solve right now. Something's about to explode. Ask a friend if you don't know that surely you get people involved. But as you solve problems, you want to be less reliant on others to solve those same problems, right? Um, and that's why that comes in at step nine. And then step 10 is called pray, which sounds, <laughs> please make this work, right? But uh, the whole concept there is it's using, uh, there's uh, a technique in software engineering that we call rubber duck debugging. I don't know if you've, you've heard of this one, but essentially it's where, you know, and software engineers face this a lot. They, they, they're struggling on a problem and it gets really, you know, mu you know, muddled up in the mind. It's clear as mud, right? So mm -hmm. you, you, you get a rubber duck, like an inanimate object of your choice, um, and you tell it the problem. You explain to it what's wrong. And surprisingly it works because as you explain it, your brain formalizes the problem in a different way and packages that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, as you explain it, you're like, and that's my problem and you can solve it. And yeah. so, you know, it's called pray because it's like when, when you pray, you're thinking through a problem. You're, uh, you're, you're thinking through something that you want to happen or you're, you know, you're expressing something, you're explaining mm -hmm. something, you're, you know, and it doesn't have to be to anyone. It can just be out loud. And so that's where this step is, it take, comes in place is to try and let our subconscious mind, our creative minds come in and help us solve the problem too. And obviously if I'm, if you're saying we're up to step 10, we've done all of these steps in a problem, you know, you're two, three, four days on a problem. You know, maybe you've experienced this where, you know, you spend all day on a problem, you, you tried everything, you go to bed, you take a nap or you, you know, you, you, you do some games or play some activities, you come back to it and bang, you solved it. Like this is part of that because the, you know, you can get your subconscious going and helping you right. solve that problem. Right. That's it. So that's the 10 steps and you can see they're very practical. They're not tied to a specific industry or anything like that. And the unique part about it is uh, it's called 10 plus one steps to problem solving because there's one more step mm -hmm. and it's kind of an anti-step. It doesn't make sense unless you know all the first 10 steps, right? So if you get the book that explains what that step is, but generally you can solve 95, 99% of your problems in the first 10 steps. So. Okay. So you're gonna leave us on the cliffhanger for the plus one. A little bit, right? just a little, I got okay. just the plus one, but maybe what I can do is we can do something cool for your audience is um, I'll do uh, what's it called? If, if anyone in your audience wants to 
get the book and they're interested in it, obviously you can go to Amazon and get the hard copy and stuff like that. But for your audience specifically, you know, maybe two week for the two weeks after this this comes out, what we can do is uh, email me, Andrew Sario at engineeringinreallife.com. Subject, you know, career coach podcast, interested in the book or something like that. Just any anything along those lines that tells me that you're a listener of, of this show and I will send you a free digital copy. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So that way anyone who's listening, if you're listening to this early when it comes out, you just let Andrew know and then you get a, access to the content. That'd be we'll that'd link be in all the, you know, all the, all the, all the links and all that stuff. But yeah, that's, that's my email and I will answer that. Um, but again, back to, you know, when you first asked what, what's the purpose of the book and I really want to share, you know, this method and guideline and get people thinking about, you know, engineering problem solving. Um, and I think this would be a great way to do that. And I think it would be uh, very valuable for your audience. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So Andrew, you covered a lot there that there's a lot in that 10 <laughs> steps that, that people could dive into every single one of those that we could spend a lot of time on, which is why you've written a whole book on the, the concept, yes. but that, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So I'm curious when we, we talk about problem solving, engineers are also trying to grow and progress in their careers. And sometimes in order to do that, they need to kind of work on their recognition and kind of improve their reputation for solving these sorts of problems and doing things. Yes. So what do you think is the real key to help engineers get a little bit more about that recognition, improve their reputation inside their companies or in workspaces? Absolutely. So I, I do deal with this a little bit because I've been mentoring, you know, engineers over the last, you know, over my career. And the there's two, there's two key things that you can do. And the first part of that is whatever your tasks are that you're given, no matter how menial or trivial, or it's not exactly what you want to be doing, you do it well. There's just no compromise on that. You do that job that you're meant to do well, regardless of if that's what you wanted to do. So that's your first basis. And you do that every time consistently, this guy does good work or this girl does good work. The second step is to go, okay, what are the types of problems that my senior engineers, that my managers are facing? Like, and I don't mean the customer problems. I don't mean the engineering problems to solve because that's, that's their job or that's the team's job but you, you observe and you watch your colleagues and see what are the things that, you know, if, if they could get this out of the way, they could focus on that bigger picture thing or, or that other thing. And if you can go in and come with a solution for that smaller thing, I came up with a quick you know, Excel spreadsheet that can make that thing that I see you do all the time easier. Do you want to use it? And all of a sudden you become, a, you build this reputation of helping people have problems go away. I send a problem to this person, it goes away. And I free up my mind, I can think of this bigger thing now, all of a sudden, they go when they have to, and, and this happens all the time, you know, you have engineering managers come out to their, to their seniors and, and their, their lead engineers and the teams and go, how are we going to resource this up? And they might say, hey, I want to get that guy because I know that that person takes all my problems away. And, but the thing is, to keep it in context is, remember step one. You cannot do that at the expense of not doing what you're meant to be doing properly because that, that, that doesn't help you reputationally and also doesn't help the company. And so what that means is what if uh, someone comes to me and says, hey, no, but for me to do that job well, it takes my full time week, 40 hours or whatever it is. It takes all my time. So how can I do any of this extra stuff? You're going to have to do it in your extra time. You're going to have to give extra time to it to, to, in order to approach that, some, uh, that stuff. But if you're in the business of going, I want to improve my reputation, I'm not saying you have to work 100 hours a week or you know, three times, four times the average person or whatever, although that could help, is is to think about it that way, right? If I need to help take these problems away and I've got this full-time thing, I'm gonna to have to invest a little bit more time. And, and I think if the combination of those two things will help you improve your uh, reputation because, and, and you know, consistently doing that, obviously you want to do it in a friendly manner. You don't wanna be stepping on people, being rude and, and helping your teammates out. You know, no one's taking from you. You combine that, that type of uh, approach with those two key things and you will improve your uh, reputation over time. Okay, excellent. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. And um, give you given a lot of great examples of, hey, how can we just go a little bit further, go the extra mile and, and make sure that no matter what we're doing, we're doing great work. And so that we yes. become known for that. And that's a, that's a really critical thing for a lot of people to understand. So finally, Andrew, as we kind of start winding down here, I'm just curious, talk a lot about problem solving. If you were to say, how can engineers just work on their problem solving skills in general, just kind of an overall tip, what would you say? 
Yep. Uh, yeah. So that 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 one. Uh, the, there's a very simple way to to answer that one, and it's practice, practice solving problems. And the problem there is, and and happens a lot of the time is, you know, and engineers in particular is they they know a lot of stuff. They should know everything already. But if you can let go of your pride and be happy to fail when you so try to solve something and it goes wrong and you didn't solve it properly or you found you didn't find the most efficient way. If you're prepared to fail in your problem solving, you know, uh, adventure, you know, trying to learn how to uh, solve things, you get more practice in, you get more reps in, and then you can become better at it because practice, you know, helps you solve to uh, solve problems more consistently. So practice is the key. I would say you need to make sure that you empty your cup so you can fill it with more stuff and not be afraid to fail when you propose a solution that doesn't work in order to get better. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much for all this. At this point, we're going to take a quick break and transition into the Take Action Today segment of the show, where we'll get one final tip from Andrew uh, to kind of sum up this episode. Now it's time for our Take Action Today segment of the show. Today, I've been talking with Andrew Sario, a problem-solving expert, written the book on 10 plus 1 steps of problem solving. Now, Andrew, as we close up today, what's a final tip that you would give people one takeaway to help them improve their problem solving skills? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, my, the final tip that I would give for uh, people trying to tackle problem solving and get better at it is to look at the tools and the things and concepts that they've learned already that they know of and see if they can apply it in a different context so that they can then begin to solve problems in a more creative way in a different way. And really the key is getting a new perspective on things and solving it that way. I love it. Thanks so much, Andrew. Now, obviously you talked about sharing your book if people are interested. What are the ways that people can connect with you, learn more about some of your engineering IRL resources and, and where should people go to, to find this stuff? Yep, yeah, uh, perfect. So the, the, the best way to find me is at uh, engineeringinreallife.com, one word, engineeringinreallife.com, or you can search up engineering IRL on social media or YouTube or wherever it is, and, or, or on your favorite pod podcast platform. Engineering IRL is probably the easiest. Um, and then, of course, the, the email address I mentioned earlier, if there's any questions, you can email me directly, and I'll be sure to answer that. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and, and chat Thank with you, you and learn from you. Thanks so much for taking your time and, and sharing with us. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and questions. Go to www.engineeringmanagementinstitute.org where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. And don't forget to check out our upcoming live webinar for this month at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org. Additionally, for those engineers struggling with unemployment or uncertain about how to make a career transition, I have created some free training resources with an opportunity to join a more intensive program called the Engineering Career Accelerator. You can find more information at engineeringcareeraccelerator.com. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering endeavors.